So with every curling season, there seems to be some new contenders and competition continues to evolve and harden. Um, but with every twist and turn in the curling saga, there seems to be one name that's always in the mix. A name now synonymous with curling is Howard, and there are a lot of them. Bill, Russ, Glenn, Carly, Scott, just to name a few in three brilliant generations of curlers, all successful in their own right and leading the game in their own ways. Our guest today, Glenn Howard, happens to have four world championship gold medals, a silver at the Olympic trials, 14 Grand Slam victories, four Briar victories, 17 Ontario Curling Championships and Briar appearances, and a staggering 218 some odd games played at the Briar, more than any other curler in history. Uh, Glenn has added international success, coaching the Scottish national team in Eve Muirhead, truly a curler's curler, one that has inspired so many to take up the game. And with all of this success, Glenn has remained in Ontario's communities of Midland uh, and Penetanguishene for most of his life. Uh, perhaps another testament to the consistency of this individual. Here to find out more about his life uh, and obviously the impact that you've had on the sport of curling and answer some of our student submitted questions from our postponed Masters of Curling camp is none other than Glenn Howard himself. Thank you for joining me. How are you? I'm great. Thanks, Rylan. Um, uh, great to be here and uh, thanks for having me. Can't wait yep. to get started. <laughs> there is uh, there's a lot with your career, so I want to start by going way back, and I mean wow. way, way back, to get a sense of where all of this kind of started uh, with the, uh, the age of some of our junior campers, uh, how you were introduced to sports, and in particular, curling. Well, it, uh, curling, in particular, curling, I started when I was about 10 years old, um, following in my big brother's footsteps, Russ. He's, uh, he's about seven years older than me, so he would have been, uh, you know, he would have been 17 or so when I started curling, but my, my father, Bill, was uh, definitely instrumental in getting both my brother and I, we're only two in the family, uh, both my brother and I into sports. It was just sports with everything. My, my dad was a really good uh, hockey player, a good baseball player. Uh, loved golf, loved curling. Um, he introduced both my brother and I into pretty much all sports and let us sort of go our own direction, pick what we liked, and then he would support, uh, as my mother did as well, would support us at any direction we went. Like he was, probably his biggest passion was baseball and both Russ and I didn't play baseball, but we both uh, both kind of gravitated toward uh, golf and then in most uh, more successfully into the curling world and uh, it was pretty easy for me to follow you know to, when I see my big brother do it you know that's kind of what you do as a little brother you kind of follow what he does and he was so successful in golf and curling that I just kind of followed along and did my thing and and our father was basically our coach he was our he taught us you know the, the pro, how to how to throw a rock how to get the proper delivery how to do that and, and that was strictly through my dad um, uh, reading reading stuff and learning as to what the, the proper tech he was a he was a technician it was all about doing it the proper way and, and his and his words to russ and i were if you have a proper delivery and curling it'll never let you down in a pressure situation <laughs> and he's telling us this at 10 10 years old and i'm going really okay dad but uh, that that's the truth that's really how uh, how i got started in the sport so my understanding is uh your your dad was was an avid reader and and basically would study all sorts of sports uh yeah. and uh, i guess maybe maybe this book here might have some relevance to you. Wow, I, I, you're not going to believe it. Just before he said it, I was going to say it was Ken Watson on curling. Was was it was my dad's Bible. He uh, he just felt that was of course Ken Watson was known to he was the first one to slide. They used to just sort of let the rock go, and Ken uh, Ken would just slide out like that. Actually, looks like my dad. My dad wore a fedora just like <laughs> that when he uh, when he curled, and uh, that was that was the way he did it back in the in the you know back in the back in the day and. Dad felt that was the way to, to curl, and he taught both Russ and I uh, the flat foot delivery and uh, and how to throw the rock. And, and Ken Watson was uh, was God to my dad. And I, I actually recall uh, from an interview, uh, and we had a student mention this. Um, and we're pretty sure it was you uh, that that said uh, everyone should try different types of delivery, like the lift delivery, for example. Um, what do you think that that maybe teaches people? Well, I think I think sometimes you can get stuck on you know, this is, you know, I think proper technique is, is you, there's certain things you definitely have to do. Like you have to have a, a big, solid, balanced delivery, wherever your sliding foot is, flat foot, tuck delivery, whatever the case may be, has to be under your sternum. You have to have proper balance. That being said, it doesn't have to be tuck. It doesn't have to be flat footed. It can be different, but that you want to get it solid and consistent. And sometimes people get hung up, well, this is the way you have to do it. And I always, uh, I always compare curling to golf. Uh, 
you, you can see it, you know, every golf swing out there on tour. I don't think any two of them are alike. You know, you can have 150 golfers. They're all a little bit different. But, you know, at, the, at impact, the golf club, the club face is square. So they know how to get it to that spot. Curling's the same. You have to have a solid uh, uh, foundation. You have to be able to slide out solid. You got to be online and you have to be able to release the rock at the, at the right point and, and be online. And however you can do it, the best. So I, I don't think there's, there's not a right or wrong, but I do believe balance is number one. You have to have a solid balanced delivery. And, and you can come out you know, sideways, but as long as you get it online at the end and consistently, that's the key. So outside of those, those books and other resources that your dad maybe provided you with, what, what were some of the best resources that you've personally come across in your development of the game uh, that you now share when you're teaching, say, say your kids or other, other curlers today? It's interesting, Rylan. I, I think, you know, majority of my young career, I watched my brother. He, uh, obviously being older, he had curled longer than me, very successful as a junior, uh, obviously very successful as an adult. Um, and he was, he was also uh, a, a tremendous golfer. So he was, he was one that, again, technique was everything. And he would try things. He was more of an innovator. He'd try this, try that, try it. If it doesn't work, doesn't work, whatever. And he did that in curling. So I, I kind of followed him. I, so I got a little bit spoiled that I could kind of pick his brain a little bit on the same token. I watched and, and I, lo- I watched all the, all the guys we curl against all the best curlers that were in the game. I'd sit and say, okay, well, how come, how come Ed Wernick is so good? How come Paul Savage is so good? And you, you sort of watch and see them and you see their, their, their consistency and their technique and their finesse. And you just sort of see what they do. And, and you kind of, and, and I use this phrase a lot. You learn by osmosis. You just sort of, it just sort of develops and you see what they do because we didn't have coaches really back then like there, back in the day there was just sort of you get a one hour clinic go show you know learn to curl and away you go and you kind of learn by fly by the seat of your pants and, and I'm not kidding it's just it was sort of the way it happened and then as you play against the best teams in the world if you're fortunate enough to do that you, you tend to again learn what they do and you get better and you, and you just you try things you experiment uh, I think today, today though, I, you know, the expertise is there and we have such great coaching that a lot of that knowledge is already in place and they can instill that in the kids today. And the kids, I think the product is so much better than it was 30 years ago because of that knowledge. Um, and again, we just sort of fly by, flew by the seat of our pants and, and, and made it work. And with that being said, you obviously mentioned your, your older brother, but I mean, uh, other guys on tour, were there anybody at your club who, who was also your mentor? Maybe it was the ice maker. Maybe it was just somebody like that. Was there somebody uh, other than your family members that, that were kind of taking you under their wing? No, uh, to be honest with you, Ryan, there really, there really wasn't. Uh, it was just a matter of we, we played. Uh, it was really just my dad. And my dad, like I said, he was such a studious uh, fellow that he would, he, would, he would learn different things. Like he was to the point where he was testing different sliding uh, uh, materials under the foot. Um, he, uh, he came up with, oh, my God, where are you getting those pictures? That's incredible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's my dad on the right. Um, uh, really cool. Uh, and he would, like, he would just, he was one of the first ones to get thick Teflon. He had quarter-inch Teflon. We used to sew it on the bottom of our shoes when I was in my, my uh, early teens. And that was never heard of in the day. And he just tried different things. He was an innovator. And, um, again, I think we, my brother and I learned mostly from him. And, again, he didn't know any different. He just sort of went out and tried to find – the knowledge, Ken Watson book, whatever the case may be, and go from there. And uh, um, we didn't have a lot, we had a lot of good curlers in our, our club, but we didn't really have anybody that jumped out at you, so to speak. Sure. And and what were the economics of the game like back then uh, for you and your household? Like, uh, what was it like with your parents? I, I assume we're also curling at the same club as you guys. Um, but I mean, your dad here is a manager, I believe. Uh, I hope I've got my facts right at the Loblaws Midland. You're correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, he, was, he was a manager of a Loblaws, a couple of Loblaws stores, uh, Midland and Collingwood over his, I think, 36 year career. And then ironically enough, when he retired from, uh, from managing uh, grocery stores, he actually went into ice making and he just learned how to make ice and, and did uh, ice making and general manager of the Penetang Curling Club and the Midland Curling Club. And that was in, that was, in, he was quite a bit older, my dad. Uh, uh, so he, uh, you know, we, we were, we were spoiled again a little bit. We had access to ice a little bit more than everybody else. And, you know, Russ and I'd be out there throwing tons of rocks and doing our thing. And, uh, that was a bit of an advantage as well. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, uh, and it sounds like just the, the level of support that they gave you, um, to kind of make your, your own decisions with the game, uh, and the other sports that you played, uh, really led to, to a comfortable start, uh, in your career and your brother's career. 
Yeah, and it's, it, you know, you, you hear different, you know, everybody's, every family's a little bit different. You hear some parents are just push, 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 and then other parents just lay back and don't, don't do anything. And I, I don't think there's any right or wrong. It's just my parents were, were of the type, they just always felt the old adage was if, if my, our kids or our boys are into sports, they're not going to get into trouble. That was always the thinking. You're not going to be on the street. You're not going to do whatever. And that was old way of thinking. But, you know, we loved both. Russ and I loved sports of all kinds. And uh, we, we attempted all kinds of different ones. And for some reason, we both sort of uh, got more attracted to the, the, the hand-eye ones, the golf and, and the curling more than anything. And, uh, um, you know, and then again, dad, just he and mom and dad both said, hey, that's great. They were both avid skiers. My mom and dad were avid skiers. Russ and I didn't ski. So they, we tried it, and huh, it wasn't that much fun. We played a lot of hockey, uh, but it, it, they, again, they didn't push, so which was kind of cool. I, I think that's really neat, and uh, you know, um, but they let it. Whatever we did, they support us, and I mean support us. They were taking us to hockey practice. They take us to curling games. We were to every bond spiel. They didn't miss events, and um, you know, there's thousands, hundreds of thousands of families out there doing the same thing, and I, it just makes it so much easier in the kids if the parents, the parents are with them, supporting and buying in. Sure. Um, so, I mean, then you kind of get into your, your junior career, your proper curling career, your first teams, um, and you started your curling career. You were also playing curling, uh, at the university of Waterloo, mm -hmm. um, Waterloo warriors. Um, yep. and, uh, do you remember that you were actually athlete of the week? Athlete of the week. I did not know I was athlete of the week. Okay. That's cool. That's, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say a couple of years ago, Rylan. <laughs> <laughs> somewhere around 81, 82, somewhere in that neighborhood. This, this may be your first accolade is the, the Athlete of the Week uh, at the University of Waterloo. And uh, you were Athlete of the Week along with uh, Carol Ranke. Um, yep. I'm just going to read this here. Uh, Glenn brings a wealth of curling experience to the varsity program. His last three years in junior curling, he skipped his rank to two second and one third uh, place men's playdowns for the past two years. Uh, and just last week finished third in Ontario. This is a tough accomplishment for any young curler. In 1980, Glenn won a trip to Scotland by winning the coveted witch tournament. The Sun Life, uh, uh, um, Sun Life Junior Bonspiel. Absolutely. Um, and his list of accomplishments goes on and on, they say, in 1980. Wow. Yes. Wow. Thank so, you uh, for that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, just, I'll bring that up on screen for you, too, because I find it yep. just a, a nice kind of thing here. So there it is. Oh, my goodness. There. 1980. Yeah, um, 1980. Wow. And, uh, and I mean, you now obviously have coached the Scottish team. Um, what was Scotland and that trip like? Was that, uh, how was that for you to, to win something like that? Well, well, first of all, was, uh, I'll tell you the, the little history behind it. Yeah, they came up with this bond spiel and it was like, a, uh, you know, you, you, a junior bond spiel, it was a $50 entry fee. So per team, so $12.50 per guy. <laughs> you go down, I, th I believe we played at the Thornhill. It was, I believe, in the Thornhill Curling Club at the time. Uh, single knockout. So you, you, you would go into a different events. But if you went through undefeated, um, you would get this, uh, you get this trip, uh, paid, all, paid, all expenses paid trip to Scotland for like a week. And we were built it all over Scotland. We went to, played something like eight or nine games over eight or nine days. We traveled every day, got billeted to different families. But uh, ironic, a little uh, tidbit to that story. The very first game we go down to play, we got in, the four of us were driving down, we got in a car accident, major snowstorm, car accident in Barrie, uh, mm -hmm. rode off the car, uh, nobody was hurt, we had a little bumps and bruises, we, we rambled over to a Holiday Inn, made a phone call, said to the committee that we're, uh, we're not going to be able to make it down to the, the bond spiel tonight, I don't know what, the, the convener at the time said, well, you're going to have to give up your first game, I said, oh, that's too bad, and he'd say, you can't win the bond spiel then. We found a bus, a bus system that was running. The, the Highway 400 was closed. We got a bus down to Thornhill. They decided to post, uh, to actually po um, uh, delay our game. Uh, as the banquet was going on, we went out and played our game, which, and I can't remember the, 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 the kids team we were playing, but they were gracious enough to go with it. Won that game. Won another game on a last shot where the skip missed it. Missed his last shot. We won. Then we won four straight or six straight or something after that. Win the bond spiel and go to Scotland. Like it was just, it was absolutely meant to be. Uh, quite a story. We're thank, thank God we lived through it. But uh, you know, to be able to go to Scotland and we were in our in our teens uh, again. Billeted. We saw whole all all over the country. Different curling clubs. Met different people. Still, I've still have friends from that trip in I guess 1980, 80, 81. I think it was. Uh, I still have friends from that. Uh, that trip and that's uh, you know that's a long time ago <laughs> 40 years ago 
Yeah, thanks so much for for sharing that. That's uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and to win that at at such a young age and to have that kind of uh, you know, just that taste of success, I'm sure uh, was maybe a driving factor for for a little while there. Absolutely, and and again, um, the other thing too that that same year, my brother won won the provincial. He won his first mm-hmm. provincial in 1980. Um, and that was so exciting for us to have a, you know, to go to a briar, his first briar and we're all pumped. And then, you know, I won a junior spiel. So it was just kind of one of those things. It wasn't close to the same thing, but on the same token, it's your, your first taste of victory. And, uh, you know, you think, uh, that this, this game is unbelievable. And, uh, I fortunately just kept sticking with it. I loved it so much that I was able to you know, continue on with my career. I mean, another thing that it mentions in there a little bit with that Athlete of the Week thing is just that uh, you also actually had, you sort of started your, your career in juniors with actually two big kind of heartbreaking losses, um, you know, in the, in the Ontario finals. That's right. Uh, I lost, yeah, we lost, I think I was 16 years old. I lost uh, a final to, uh, uh, to John Kawaja. And <laughs> then we lost another final the following year to John Bass. Uh, John Kawaja went on to lose the Canadian junior final. And John Bass went on to win the World Junior. So uh, we lost to some pretty good teams. And then I think the following year, I ended up coming third. It was, uh, it was the next year and couldn't break out. And it was obviously frustrating. Uh, uh, interesting, though, I remember one of my father's biggest, uh, one of his biggest advice pieces to both my brother and I was, uh, you, you, you can't learn, you don't know how, you can't learn how to win until you learn how to lose. And uh, I kept that to heart. I thought, you know what, it was two or three tough losses. Uh, you know, second sucks. I'm going to be honest with you. There's nothing worse, uh, but it makes you hungrier to come back and, and do it again. And I think sometimes if you get too many successes too soon, uh, maybe you don't really understand that. And I had my bumps along the way uh, and I definitely learned from it. And uh, thank God I had a few wins in the, in the future, but because uh, you don't want to lose that final too often. Sure. Yeah. And there's Johnny yeah. Kowadja right there. Yeah. The, uh, I think the, it's it's not always seen like once once you get to a, a spot where you're playing on TSN or at the Grand Slams, you see these top teams that have established uh, a level of consistency. You know, winning sixty to seventy percent of their games. Um, it's not it's not always apparent um, that they come from you know the, these these starting places where um, it's not all glory. Uh, you know, and you've you've had to learn through some of those those bumps, like you said, in the road uh, to get where you were going and. Right after that junior career, uh, there's kind of a four-year gap, I'll call it, where you can't really find a whole lot about Glenn Howard curling. Um, before you joined your brother's team at Vice, um, what happened between your junior career and that decision to play with your brother? Well, to be honest with you, the university got in the way a little bit. Um, you know, I went to university in 1981 to 85. Um, you you got to concentrate on your studies. You have to you know, albeit my parents were very supportive of our curling, they were also very supportive of an education. And I just, it was just too difficult. I was able to do a little bit, obviously I was able to do university curling, but to do your studies and and try and get a degree and try and, um, you know, have a part-time job and try and curling and doing this sort of thing, it just, it just got in the way. I think I'm going to use that as an excuse, (laughs) but I, I just couldn't, I couldn't focus as much on curling as I would love to have. Um, but I did join uh, I right basically out of, I, I started to curl with my brother in, I think, 83, 84. So right near the end of my, uh, my um, uh, university uh, years, I was started to join with Russ. And I was okay, but it was really when I graduated and got out of school and started to have a job. That's when I personally got a little bit better, joined Russ at third, and then really got fortunate enough to go to our first prior in 1986. And that... Uh, that was so exciting. And I was, I think I was 24 years old at the time and felt, you know, just at a university feeling really good. I'm thinking, okay. And then I kind of was able, again, I was able to uh, focus a little more on curling and get better at it. How would you say the atmosphere between that first Briar and your most recent Briar experience, uh, bereft of maybe the wild card experience uh, from last season, um, how would you say those, those two uh, events compare uh, for you? Well, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people say, what, what was your favorite prior? And I, I was fortunate to play in quite a few of them and they all were. And uh, I cherish every one of them as, 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 as if they were my first or last, or whatever the case would be. Obviously, I like the ones you won better than the ones you didn't. But uh, yeah, I think the very first one is, it, it, you know, wet behind the ears, 24 year old, um, full of, pardon the expression, piss and vinegar. I was just ready to go. And, and I couldn't believe that I'm at this event and, and I'm, 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 
you know, I'm at the pinnacle. And, and as I, growing up, even today, you know, to go to the briar, to play in a briar is, is every curler's dream, male curler, and then obviously the Scotties for the women. And uh, to be in that position and absolutely playing there was just surreal. And I, I can remember, I remember like it was yesterday, it was in the kitchen of Waterloo in 1986 and uh, uh, local, we were, we were the local uh, favorites. We were hometown and uh, you know, and then I've all of a sudden all these people, I've never curled in front of all these people before. And I think there was five, 6,000 people in the odd in, in Kitchener and they're cheering for us. And I'm going, they don't even know who we are. And, but it's Ontario and they're cheering for Ontario. And I'm going, and, and really, I think, getting that you know I had some losses in junior but I had some quick success in men's and then and then I was hooked soon as I go oh my god we got to get back like we we've just got to get back to this again and you know and I made some comment I vowed we're going to come back and win this thing some cocky thing which I'm not normally cocky and fortunately we went back in 87 and, and did but uh uh, I just couldn't get enough of it. I just, this is the pinnacle of curling. And let's, let's, I enjoyed it so much that uh, I was so excited. I'm going to work my tail off to try and get back again. And back then uh, in the eighties, late eighties, um, were you thinking about things like mental toughness or was it more focused on delivery? What, what was, cause the game has changed so dramatically uh, to this point where, um, you know, the, the level of athleticism in the game and, and sports psychology and the analytics. Um, what was it like back then kind of inventing all that stuff? Yeah, there was virtually zero of that, <laughs> Rylan. Uh, uh, you know, we, we weren't working out uh, per se. Uh, you did a little bit, but very little. You, we weren't, nutrition wasn't involved. We didn't have uh, mental, uh, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have physical trainers. We didn't have mental toughness. We didn't, we just were, again, like I use the phrase flying by the seat of our pants, just go out and make shots. And, and you, I think a lot of it you, you learned, you didn't realize you, you were using, we were using, uh, you know, mental um, techniques and we didn't know we were using them. We were doing, you know, we were talking to ourselves, we were helping out. We were, I think we were doing it, but we didn't actually have a title for it. And we were probably uh, doing all kinds of different things, you know, tweaking deliveries and this sort of thing. And there, it wasn't formalized and it really wasn't, um, it wasn't out there that this is the way to do it. We were kind of just doing it on our own. So we felt like we were, innovators in a way and and yet all the curlers back in the day were doing that because we didn't we didn't have the coaching we didn't have the expertise we were just going on what we've seen on, t on television or what we've we've seen in the the local uh, curling club and the, who are the better players and we're watching them and, and that's how we were learning and it wasn't coming from from above it was just sort of coming from laterally where we were curling and amongst the, the, the competitors we were playing absolutely i mean the uh, the techniques that uh that you maybe learned along the way that would maybe help junior curlers the most to develop their mental toughness at this point. Um, for example, how to quickly recover after missing a, uh, an important shot in a game uh, or something of that nature. Uh, what would you say is, is your biggest piece of advice for, for that? Well, you, and it's funny, again, back in the day, we did none of that. It was just like, you just suck it up, you know, suck it up, buttercup, like just you'd figure it out. But today, I think, just drop it. Like you, you have to, I, you just you, you put it in perspective you've missed a bad shot five minutes ago you can't control it you can't do a darn thing about it if the more you think about it moving forward the more it's going to be detrimental to your success and I think if, if the kids can understand that it, you have to park it you just have to put it behind you uh and and the others is learn from it like how why did you miss it was it was it a mental thing was it a physical thing was it uh uh, a lack of focus. What? What? Like, try and d dissect it. Not in those five minutes, but after the game's over, sit back. And I love that what teams do now. They do their debriefs, which again, a debrief. I didn't even know what that was until the last few years. Um, but that's what teams do now. And you go and you dissect things out, and you figure out, okay, okay, Ryland, why did why did you miss the draw in the sixth end? Like, what what's what's what were you thinking? What were you, and and if you can kind of pull that out, then people you can work with people to figure out how to make you better. We had zero of that in the, in the, in the, back in the day. It was just, you know, my brother would say, Glenn, smart enough, just make that shot the next time. And, and sometimes that works. Sometimes that's some, you know, maybe that's okay for me, but for Ryland, it might not be. And that's the other thing I, I, I always stress with um, the kids today is really get to know your players. I understand how each of the play, your players tick. So if Ryland is a really sensitive guy, and I'm picking on you because I'm looking at you. But if Ryland's a really sensitive guy and he doesn't want criticism, well, then don't be hard on him. Figure out what's going to make Ryland better. If you've got to stroke him a bit or hop him, pussyfoot around him, that's fine. But figure out what makes Ryland better. He's your teammate. You want him to be better. You might be different than Bob, our third. 
you know, so Bob, we, he might be, he might be a hard ass and then you can come back at him and you can give him the gears. But that's, I think what, and that's where coaching comes in as well. But as teammates, it's so key to have, to learn how each other ticks so that when you're on the ice, you're the four of you. You don't have a coach with you all the time. You have to help each other out because you want to make your players better. The more you can make them better, the more success you're going to have. So, I mean, over the years, uh, talking a little bit about that DNA of the team uh, and how everybody sort of clicks together. When you're now building a team, are you feeling like you're filling each role uh, with a certain purpose or do you feel like you're creating a supporting cast? Um, at this point, do you feel like you have a formula that you like to stick to with, with the style and, and the designs of your, your teams? A little bit of everything, Rylan. I, I, now first and foremost, I, I have to to enjoy the three other players I'm playing with. If, if there's if one of the three I don't like or uh, bugs me or whatever is going to get on my, uh, it, under my skin, I don't want to play with him. Um, it just, it's, and he could be the best curler in the world. I'm, I'm, I'm the type that I'm not going to deal with that very well. I'd rather have three guys that I'm going to have a ton of fun with and we're going to be out there and play. Now, obviously they have to have some talent. Uh, and then you, you sort of look today now, you sort of look at different positions and what kind of what their, their uh, skill set is and what they bring to the table. So you definitely have to look at that. Um, but again, number one, and I, I say this to the kids today, you know, you may have the four and, and you hear it a lot. It may be the four best players or these four guys, but they're not going to get along. And I just they may be successful, but it won't last. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be a, like a one shot deal, one year deal, and then they'll blow up. And you, you really have to find four players that get along and really take ownership for their position. And I say that, you know, I'm serious about that because I sometimes have seen a front end player who really wants to play back end, but they're stuck playing front end and their head's not in it and they just can't perform because of it. You really need four guys, four people, four players to own, take ownership of their position and therefore you'll be a lot more successful. Sure. And I think um, with that accountability, um, there's, there's always a lot of talk about having a formal, say, team contract and things like that in, in curling circles. Um, I think popularized sort of by Pat Ryan and in that era. But uh, do you ever use a team contract or um, how are you keeping your teammates accountable as the, as the leader, as the skip of the team? I've never had a, We've never had a team contract and all the teams I've, I've been on um basically it's a it's, it's sort of a handshake let's uh, and you, you you call them up at the the, be, the beginning of the year and say boys are we ready to play again mm -hmm. um and yeah it, it, it's I mean, it might be different i've heard of contracts there are contracts out there it's becoming it seems to be going down that route uh it's becoming a business um i know of a lot of very successful teams that didn't really like each other so that's contrary to sort of the way i i design my teams um as a skip, you, you tend to be a little bit more demonstrative. Uh, I'm an easy going skip. I'm one of those guys that I kind of, uh, I'm not hard on my guys. I just don't believe in that. I, I think I can get uh, more out of them by, by being uh, um, not, not as hard nosed, but also I know the type of players I have. Um, I've had different personalities all over my career, different guys. And again, I, I've learned how to, you know, figure them out as the, you know, what makes them better. And all my guys that I've played with understand me, they know how, what they think, what, if I'm going through a rough spot, they know what to say to Glenn. Uh, they, they figure out, because there's no use getting mad at Glenn, because that's not going to work. Um, you know, uh, guys like Richard and, and, and Brent and Craig always knew that if they cracked, Rich was awesome. He'd crack a joke, get me laughing. And that was the best thing. He, he knew that would work for Glenn. Um, so that's just an example. And uh, those little things are unbelievable. That can turn a player on the spot from, a, from having a rough game to one of the better games. Yeah, I think that's that's amazing through and through just really understanding the communication styles of your teammates. Um, and I mean, it's you can practice all summer and you can practice, uh, you know, your training and everything like that to, to make yourself, you know, two or three percent better. But if you can do something where you're communicating to your team and everybody's working as a team and it's making everyone 10 percent better, it's it turns, like you said, in an instant. And I think, uh, yeah, I don't know how much uh, attention people necessarily pay to that. I think, uh, I think it's a hard thing for, for teams to, to grasp and develop uh, without a lot of time spent together and, and that history there with, with the teammates. And, and, and you're right, Rylan. And I think that's where I, I, I do see a lot of teams changing, changing uh, teammates over the years and, and constantly making changes. And as soon as you make a change, it's, it's, it's a whole new dynamic. Now you've got to get used to this new individual. They have to get used to you. And, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the more you get to know them and over time, 
the better chance I think you can you understand how how each other each other ticks, and in experience is everything. The more you play with them under pressure situations, you can go play in the club, you can go and practice, you can everybody's having a great time, you're doing this, you're, and that's fine. But as soon as you get into a game situation. And, and your coaches around, but now when you're in a game situation, it's a crucial game. Maybe it's one to stay in a bond spiel or go to the next level, win the semifinal. And all of a sudden things don't go well. Hmm. That's when the four of you have to understand how do we get out of this funk? And I use the word funk. We've got to figure this out because there's no tomorrow. The coach is in the background. He can't help me right now. And how the four of you can figure each other out. And sometimes it comes as a shock like oh my god we i i didn't i had no idea i was going to feel like this in the in the eighth end of the final game right exactly so this you can talk about all those stuff and, and you can try and until you learn it until you feel it until you un, uh, experience it um you don't really know how you're going to react but again that's where experience comes in the more you get into that position the better you know how yourself how you feel and how you're going to play and how your teammates will play some guys go if, if they play poorly they'll get quiet if they're quiet, you know they're not themselves. They're not concentrating. They're losing focus. How do we get them from not being quiet? Because that'll help. So these are just little things, and I think that's really, really crucial on teams to to, to figure out how, like I said, how each other ticks. Um, so when you were playing with with your brother, who obviously is is one of your mentors and and a personal hero, obviously, uh, of you and many curlers, um, in that era, you were playing vice. Um, and I mean, I think so many people now think of you as, as Glenn Howard, the skip, um, as you've been skipping now for, for decades. Um, how do you compare your approach to, uh, vicing as a player versus, uh, you know, now skipping, like, what did you bring to each role that, that you feel is maybe different in the same? It, it is it is a completely different position, and I, I'll be honest with you. When I first started, I was a uh, felt like I skipped a bit in junior, obviously. Then I went, I don't know, fifteen or so years as a, as a vice with Russ, um, and I felt I, I felt I was going to be a career third. I just uh, I felt that you know Russ and he he and I are going to go off into the sunset together, and I was going to be a third. Never had any aspirations of playing skip. Just kind of came out of that. Can be another conversation later in the in the program, but. Um, <laughs> Uh, I love third. I just actually thought it was a great position. Uh, it's stressful. There's a lot of pressure. The, you, you don't have to make every shot. Uh, but what was it? I, I always think the third's the key position on any team because they're the conduit between the skip and the front end. Hmm. And they always think that it's a back end, front end thing. But the, I think the third is the key because the third's down at the, uh, with the, the lead and the, and the second, and they're talking away, talking away, and the skip's in no man's land down at the other end. They have their little kibitz, and then when they, and the third comes down and then talks to the skip. The front end quite often doesn't. So the, the third comes down, and they do their thing. So they've always, they're, in, they're in the know. The third's more in the know than anybody else on the team. And if there's any issues, they can be that conduit between. And I think they're, you really have to be a diplomat. You have to be able to uh, understand people. You have to be able to communicate well. And I think um, it, it's, a, again, a key position to do that. Whereas now when I went, when it became skip, all that was gone because now I'm, I'm a lonely uh, participant down the other end. Uh, uh, and I had a serious FOMO. I was fear of missing out. I, I've all my career, I've been talking to everybody. Now I'm down at the other end talking to the opposition skip and it's, it's, it wasn't as much fun. So I always kind of wanted to know what was going on. So then at the time, you know, when I first skipped, Richie was my third and Rich would be always one. Okay, what's going on? Tell me what's happening. And, and he'd be the conduit. And, uh, but that's what I, I found. It was, it's lonely. It's, it's a way, it's a lonely position versus a third, but it's, uh, both are, both are fun. And part of my history, did you play with Richard Hart, uh, before that point, um, at any point or, no. or just when, when you started your own team, your own rank? Well, uh, just when I started and I credit him for, he, he's the reason I got into skipping. Um, mm -hmm. I played, um, so Russ moved away in about 96, 97. I dabbled a couple of years, uh, skipped a little bit. I played uh, with Eddie Wernick, my, one of my uh, all-time favorites. We played a year together. We dabbled a bit. And then Rich was successful uh, third for Mike Harris. And uh, he thought, thought it was time to move on. And he, he saw something in me, I guess, playing against him over the years. And he called me up the one day and he says, Glenn, uh, are you interested in skipping? I go, well, maybe what I said, if I had the right third and he goes, I said, are you interested? He goes, absolutely. And we just sort of talked a bit more. And I said, Rich, you know what? I'd love to give it a go. Be patient with me. And he was, we picked up uh, Colin and Jason Mitchell and we were quite successful the first few years. And I was probably holding everybody back. I wasn't quite adapting to the skip position as, as well as I'd hoped, but I was learning a ton. And well, what, were, what, what were those setbacks that, that you had when you made that change? Was it just a confidence thing or? 
I think partly uh, we were we kept qualifying in spiels and losing. We qualify and then lose, qualify and lose. So we were always weren't getting that next step to get. We weren't winning enough, and I think I was missing a few shots. Uh, um, I can't remember quite well, but I, I was missing some key shots that uh, you have to make as a skip. Um, I lost a little bit of confidence, and then again, the more and more, and my the guys were so supportive, and the more and more I got into the position, I thought, okay, it's just another shot, another shot, and I kept getting better and better and better, and then finally we leaped. Uh, uh, unfortunately for for uh, uh, Jason and Colin, it was shortly after that I got a little, I personally got a little bit better, and then we, uh, uh, Rich, uh, we brought on Brent and uh, Brent Lang, Craig Savile, and then. We had some. We had a really good run for almost a decade. The rest is the rest is history there. Yeah. Was yeah. Um, and I mean, when you uh, you said you were missing some shots in there, key shots, um, and uh, you know maybe confidence was struggling. You've got obviously the the group believes in you still. Um, what did you take on personally in your practice regimen? Did you change anything, or did you just kind of put blinders up and 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 keep going into the next tournament with with different aspirations? I didn't change much other than the mental part. I think I think I had to get over that hurdle of making the last shot to win games. Um, I would miss a few here and there. And again, you know, for most of the, the 15 years prior to that, starting skipping, I was a third. You didn't have to make every shot. If I missed my last shot, Big Brother would clean up that. Well, all of a sudden, now I'm Big Brother. I'm the one that has to do it. I played solid, but I didn't play as well as I wanted to, and I knew – I wasn't playing as well at skip as I was at third. And I knew there, okay, there's something's not right here. Um, and I just persevered. And I really, I didn't seek help because there really wasn't, again, I didn't, back then, you know, I, I, even then we went, I, there was sports psychology, we, you know, people were talking about it a bit. I know it was out there, but we really didn't dabble in it enough. Probably should have seeked it out a little more. Um, but then he just, just helped my teammates. Rich, Rich was really good. He was a good help. He was a, he's really strong personality. And, um, you know, he, uh, he helped me out a lot as a skip and, uh, um, you know, I, I give him a lot of credit for that. And, um, I've, I've, I've talked a little bit with Brendan, uh, like Brendan Botcher a little bit at length about, uh, staying focused on the ice, uh, and some of the techniques that he uses. Um, one of the things that we talked about, uh, at length once was, uh, the idea of everyone focusing on, you know, their pre-shot routine, but also for skips, especially having a, a bit of a post-shot routine, similarly to how you would review uh, things in your head after a game, uh, but shot by shot. Um, is there anything in particular that you feel helps you get ready for the next shot? Is there anything you're really focused on as the opponent is playing their shot and you're preparing for your team's next shot? Uh, a lot, not a ton, uh, Rylan. Other than um, you know, you're 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 pretty much get you pretty much have a good idea what shot you're going to play. Um, you, you know, when I play anybody, I just assume that I'm playing Brendan Botcher, Brendan Botcher is going to make that shot. He is going to. So when he makes that shot, this is what I'm left with. So I'm already preparing myself uh, for the next shot I'm going to play. It's going to be a, an intern come around draw. Well, if, if by chance all of a sudden, yeah, Brendan Botcher misses that shot, now I got to change my way of thinking, which is okay because that's the way curling is. It's constantly developing and evolving. But I'm, I'm, I'm thinking ahead of what I think I'm going to probably be playing and preparing myself, and I'm trying to get as much information that I can to make that shot. In other words, I'll, I'll maybe time a rock, or I'll, look for, I'll, look, I'll watch the walk coming down. I'll see if it, the break, where the break point is. I'll, I'll see if it's slowing down. I'll, 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 I'll watch the releases, whether the, you know, it was set or it was hooked, or this sort of thing. And I get as much information as I can, so then I can compute that and put that into the memory banks, and then I'll be ready for my shot. Perfect. I think there's uh, there's a few kind of questions that uh, might come across as a little bit uh, disjointed here. I'm just trying to get to some other student questions uh, while I've got you here. I think the uh, one of the questions is you and your brother essentially created the free guard zone rule um, from three to four and now five. What are some other rules you'd be interested in seeing applied to the game of curling in the near future? Well, actually, I had a couple the other day, and I've, I've almost already forgotten them. Um, I think I think you're going to see we're probably going to go to eight ends. Um, I think that's probably going to be the way it is. Um, I do like uh, I, the thinking time. Obviously, is something that is it has revolutionized that the game. Um, but then, by far, the number one is, and I give Russ is the one that came up with the free guard zone, the no, the, the Moncton rule back in the day. And you can't hit. He started kind of the process, um, and we used to do it in practice just because we got bored of hitting. Um, that I think is the best rule that's ever happened to our game, and it's revolutionized it. And and the game is so much more fun to play. Uh, the games are a little too long. I think if we go to eight ends, um, and then I think if we have this uh, 
I love the thinking time. It just doesn't penalize a team and, and the type of strategy, what they do. Um, something I could see happening in the future, I, I haven't decided whether I like it or not, is um, if you, the tick shot, obviously the tick shot is such a talented shot and, and, the, and the, everybody's getting so good at it. And unfortunately, when people get too good at it, you look for change because you want to, you want to, you want the game to be interesting because the only reason game, curling games are interesting is because of the misses. And that's what, what makes it the fun. I'm wondering if there might be a time I could see happening where if the, if the, the first two rocks aren't touching the center line, mm -hmm. uh, uh, if they, uh, if they're touching the center line, they will not be able to be a tick shot. If you've missed the center line, then you can play the tick shot. Mm -hmm. uh, there's talk of that. That would be interesting. That puts even more talent onto the front ends to, to make that absolutely perfect. Um, because uh, I think what's happening now, you know, the tied up, tied up with coming home. Uh, I know in the men's game right now is probably 90%. The, the team with hammer wins. They make the two tick shots and, it's, and guys aren't missing peels. So now if they throw that rock up and it's an inch off the center line, you can't play the tick shot. So yeah. that's, that's interesting. I could probably see that coming. Um, other than that, I haven't thought of too many more. The game's in a good place. I do love, I love the five rock rule. Um, you know, I loved all the versions of it. When we went to Moncton, to the three rock, to the four rock, to the five rock, I think we progressed beautifully. I think the game has had to do that. Um, but I think the five is in a good place right now. Um, one of the things that really changed uh, in, in curling with with the introduction of the Grand Slams. I had a student uh, forward me this article to ask you a little bit about explaining uh, the original 18. Oh, right, yeah, so back in the early, well, back in 2000, 2001, 2002, in that neighborhood, um, what ended up happening was a lot of the highly competitive teams at the time thought that we were not really getting let's say enough exposure or just deserve whatever the case may be when it comes from uh, curling and a lot of the big uh, curling Canada events, um, the Briar, uh, whatever the other events were at the time. And we just felt that, uh, you know, it was, it was hard enough trying to make a few, make ends meet um, over the years um, with sponsorship. And it was pretty tough that we felt that uh, it was time that uh, we spoke up as a group and kind of went on our own route and, and did our own thing. And, um, that was sort of the inception of the Grand Slam series and Sportsnet got involved. They loved the idea. They kind of jumped on and, and we're going to try and make this whole different series. And, um, because of that, uh, we had decided for, there was, I guess, 18 teams that said, uh, signed a, uh, kind of a, call it a contract, kind of a, whatever you want to call it, a piece of paper. We all sort of band together and said, uh, this is the way we're going to work. It's going to play in these events and, uh, we're not going to play in, uh, uh, curling Canada events and uh, we just felt that it was something that needed to be done for the game um, and, and it was something very proud of to be honest with you because what, ha what happened after that was the communication between players and, and the Canadian Curling Association at the time wasn't very good. It's now so much better. Communication starting to get a lot better. It did get a lot better after this sort of, they use the word boycott, but it was and that's I guess in a way what it was. Um, so the communication got better. And then as a result, um, I think the Can Curling Canada and Curling, uh, Canadian Curling Association took a look in the mirror and realized that, you know, uh, maybe there's some other things we can do to help out these athletes. We need the athletes, the athlete, athletes need us. And, you know, um, Canada Cup was, was evolved out of that. The uh, Continental Cup was evolved. Funding, there was never any monies at the Briar. There was no purse. There was no your expenses were covered. That was it. Now there's monies at the Briar. There's a funding, there's a card, B card. There's all kinds of stuff that have developed right after this uh, 18 team sort of boycott. And um, it, it's, I think it's made the game better. Uh, it's allowed athletes to get a little bit more money so they can train. Um, you know, some of these athletes that are, are funded can, can do this without, you know, without having a full-time job. Uh, and this has basically all come out of um, the 18 teams that did this, uh, this, sort of call it an event or call it a boycott, whatever you want to call it, uh, 20 years ago. And um, the game is definitely better because of it. And uh, I think, uh, I think the, you know, the boys, uh, they're pretty proud of it. Um, with the Grand Slam series, obviously, Kevin Martin was, uh, was very involved with, with the Grand Slam and still is. It's, uh, you know, one of his projects, I think. Um, he was known to, to, or at least I've heard a few stories through the grapevine to, to have a few different clever ways to, to get a little bit of an advantage on the opponent. Uh, and I have one uh, kind of gutsy question from 
uh, from one of our students that uh, wants me to ask what you thought of Kevin Martin using the corn broom uh, to sweep in the early 90s, they believe, uh, to potentially affect the ice. And they, they thought you would know exactly what, uh, what I'm talking about. I, I, I remember it well, yes. Um, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was legal. At the time it was legal, it was questionably ethical is really what, what it was sort of looked at. Was it, was it something... Was it gamesmanship? Was it, uh, you know, Kevin, Kevin's a fierce competitor. He's, he's arguably, you know, the best curler that ever lived. Um, incredible successes. Uh, he felt that it was something he could do to maybe either disrupt the other team or, or to get in a bit of an advantage. And um, it was, it, it was an illegal, it was a legal move. He kind of swept kind of backwards with this corn broom and the, 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 the chaff went into the, the running surface of the rock. And um, it was looked upon with, sideways by a lot of people and thought that maybe ethically that's not the right move uh, i'll be honest with you it's not something i might have done but uh i'm not saying he's right or wrong but he was he's a fierce competitor and he was trying to win and uh, what you sometimes it's uh, you do what you got to do to, to 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 win um did I, I mean we now have directional sweeping we have a lot of this stuff uh that that with the the analysis of the game uh, has kind of come with it um, were there any things that uh, that you and your brother felt uh, you were doing ahead of the curve uh, to have little advantages like something like that in a game? Yeah, back um, Russ again. Russ was really he was he always thought outside the box. I, I didn't as much as him, and he was always looking for different ways to you know, different sliding materials. There was never any rules. Like you could just you could slide on whatever the heck glass, stainless steel, Teflon, whatever. He was always looking for different ways to, to get better, and, and, and he would, he would uh, test stuff. One thing he kind of did a lot of was, was we snow plowed. And back in the day, there was, we, we used um, uh, corn. We would sweep with corn. Other teams would sweep with corn. And then the push rooms were starting to come in in the, uh, in, in the early days, in the 80s, the low, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, and then they were becoming – and then if he, he felt if you just put the broom down in front of the rock and pushed hard that the chaff from the corn would hit the bristles fly up over the rock and not disrupt the rock at all. And back then it was, you were allowed to do that. There was no, the sweeping rule, which has changed a hundred times in my career. Uh, that was one you were allowed to snowplow. Yeah, and, and, and you just put the brooms down in front of the rock and you, and you kind of just went right down the ice. And that was awesome. It was very, very effective. And it was something we used that, uh, you know, same other teams didn't. And then they sort of picked up on it and, and other teams would find stuff and we'd pick up on that. So you're, you're always looking for different ways to, um, not to bend the rules by any stretch, but you're looking for an advantage if you can. Mm -hmm. I mean, largely a lot of those things do lead to changes in the game that are for the better uh, at the end of the day uh, anyways. Um, and I mean, some of the things give all the teams an advantage as it becomes publicly known or, or are removed from the game if it's, if it's deemed detriment, detrimental to, uh, to the style of play and the entertainment. Um, I mean, uh, with, with all those things, when you're, you mentioned Russ kind of testing these things out, I mean, uh, what, what sort of lengths would he go to, 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 to run these experiments? Oh, like literally hours and hours and hours. And he'd, um, you know, more, not so much the sweeping cause we didn't, as it turns out, I don't think we understood what we were doing until the last, you know, four or five years of the current game that we might've been sweeping wrong all these years. Uh, so that was one that we didn't dabble in enough. Um, but a lot of it was, uh, we dabble in, in rock, you know, spinning rocks, trying rocks. Um, uh, our old, old buddy of ours, uh, Shorty Jenkins, was uh, a good friend of ours, and he was arguably the best ice maker that had ever lived. And he experimented with stuff, so we had his ear. He'd exp he'd tell us he would give us some information that he's learned about rocks, and we're constantly trying to get information. Uh, you know, if rocks were changing and and different surfaces, and where different sur uh, uh, different types of rocks react differently on this ice, and and so on and so forth. It wasn't it wasn't straightforward and, and when you grew up you just thought well all rocks are the same all ice is the same it's curling well no that's not the case we really learned a lot and one thing that we did become very good at and we realized that uh, rocks were not the same um because we, we trusted our abilities we said i'd say you know i'd say russ that one's three feet slower he goes what it's it's three feet slower i swear it and we would believe in ourselves and we were really good at matching rocks and that was a huge advantage um i think it's a, still a great advantage today if you were a good team that can match rocks and figure out the nuances on one curls a little bit more one's a little bit slower one's a little bit faster whatever the case might be if you can figure those out uh quicker than the other team you have got a major advantage and all rocks are not the same and uh like i said russ and i and, and the teams we played on were very good at that and that was a i, I felt a, a huge advantage moving forward against uh, you know some of the teams that we played against. 
I mean, I know with, with the rocks in particular, uh, on tour, there's a number of teams that are sharing rock information, bond spiel to bond spiel, uh, with the changes and freshly sanded rocks and things like that. Um, I mean, for, for a lot of people, uh, there's still kind of this mystery uh, around junior curling for coaches. What is the best way to kind of scout rocks when you're at an event uh, like that? Like, you see a lot of people using binoculars, things like that. What, in your opinion, uh, what, what's been the best thing for, for just building a catalog of rocks for you guys? Well, it really, it's, it's um, you know, obviously, if you've played them yourself, that's the best. You, you now, you four players understand, you know what the rocks are doing, you mark them down. I still write them down manually in a book, a little handbook. I, you know, number five, I threw five and six, five curls a little bit more than six, uh, two is a little bit slower than one, uh, four is a huge pig, and it, it's eight feet slow. Uh, we write this down, and now with sandpapering and the way they, and texturing rocks, things, they, they'll change a little bit from, from an event to an event, but it's quite often the idiosyncrasies still show up, which is quite amazing to me. Um, but again, we didn't have any, nobody had a binocular back in 30 years ago and nobody was checking it out, but they knew that if, you know, the gamesmanship would happen if, if, if Ryland had choice of rocks and, and Russ and Glenn just played a, a, an amazing game, the game before with yellow, Ryland's going to pick yellow because he knows that's going to be, that's going to tick off. And those little, we did a lot of that stuff. Today, they got binoculars. It's okay to, and, and that's something, it's a tool. You know, and I, I, we've done it before, you know, I'll look and I'll find teams that are really good at matching rocks and I'll kind of follow them. Uh, some teams aren't as good at it. It's okay to get the order, but the problem is why are they throwing it? Because for years, I would always have one, a bit of a cutter. So Glenn's throwing six and seven. They think, oh, they must be fine. Well, they don't know. The binocular tells you six or seven, but doesn't know that Glenn likes six because it curls a little more than seven. Mm -hmm. um, and those little things you can't pick up with, but you can get, you can catalog, and it is a good starting point, as opposed to throwing them straight up. If, if uh, you know, Ryan just had a great game, his team played awesome the game before, and they're all mixed match, and I know that order, that's a good order to start with, and then maybe we can practice with them. And if you don't have practice, at least it's something we can go with. Um, you know, if the second played a horrible game, maybe his rocks aren't very good. That's something that you can know. But the binocular doesn't tell you that. It just gives you the numbers. You don't really understand what the rocks and the, and the characteristics of them are. And I'm, I mean, obviously, uh, there's there's a number of skips and, and players working with Joanne Rizzo. Uh, she's someone who also uh, testaments to liking having a, a cutter and a straight rock. Um, can you just elaborate on that for, for the students, uh, how that's an advantage? Well, if, if you've got a, you know, then the ice conditions, again, we, we used to run around, and back in the day, ice conditions were a little bit straighter than they are today. Um, and you would always run around trying to find a rock that would curl more than everybody else's. So if you have a rock that curls more than everybody else, you can make shots that the other team can't follow, can't get to. You can get to rocks that they can't. Um, generally speaking, they're a little slower, but if you know that, you can throw a little harder, but you always know it's going to curl. That was a huge advantage. And uh, as opposed to straight, I wouldn't, we would never, ever, ever, I, to this day, if we find out there's, there's eight rocks on our, you know, we're throwing eight rocks. If there's any straight ones, I will not throw them. There is no way in a million years, even if it's, um, uh, swingy ice, I will not throw straight rocks. I just, cause they're different they're, I feel they're different than the rest and they're hard to read that you can't get the spots where somebody else can. Um, I'll always get at least, I, I, I like pretty much like a match pair now cause the ice we curl on today curls enough that you don't have to have a cutter. Um, cutters are very, cutter or one that curls more, that's a phrase, um, on straight ice for sure. If you can get a rock that curls a little more than everybody else's, that's a weapon and that's a big advantage. And uh, who will you give those rocks that you don't like to on your team? We generally go with the lead. Um, it, there's always this uh, uh, conversation. I know a lot of teams will give them to the second. Um, we tend to we go to we go our lead, which we're, the jury's out on that one. I'm not sure it's right or wrong. A lot of it depends on the individual. If you've got a lead that has no problem with that and can adapt and, and adjust to, uh, to a, a bad set of rocks, we call them a, a different set of rocks, then perfect. Um, ironically enough, today, I played golf with Brent Lang. Brent Lang is now a lead. And I said, what's your biggest, uh, what's your biggest uh, uh, hurdle that you've noticed over, you know, moving from second to lead? And he goes, I throw different rocks. He says, that's the big thing. But he says, I'm okay with it. I'll, if, if it's six feet slow, I'll throw a little bit harder. There's some players can't do that. They just can't get their head around it, so it's not worth it. Then give it to a different player who can. Uh, but what we'll do also, if, if it's quite a bad set of rocks in that they're really mismatched and the lead's throwing them, if you get a bit of a lead, 
ahead in the game, like four or five points, we'll maybe give them to the second because you're going to tend to throw peels and hits and it's not, you're not, you don't need the finesse part of it as much when you're up. Uh, I still think though, the second, you still need a couple of good rocks. They've got to make a, a lot of finesse shots as the game goes on. If they've got mismatched rocks, then it's later in the, in the end, maybe it's a little bit more detrimental. So we, we tend to move them to the lead position. Yeah, I think that argument of giving them to the lead or the second seems to stem from the idea that, you know, the lead's got to kind of set up the end. Right. Um, and it's kind of like your, your serve in tennis. It's, it's very important that you get those, those two rocks into position so you can play out the rest of your strategy. Um, and I mean, maybe that's in the DNA for certain teams. I don't know if there is a right or wrong answer. I think, uh, I think mm-hmm. you kind of hit the nail on the head with saying, you know, uh, it's kind of dependent on the player and if they're able to adapt to, to that and if it's in the game plan. Right, exactly. You're exactly right, Rylan. I think that's uh, and and you you did again. That's where you discuss as a foursome. And there's there's some players go. I, I just can't throw mismatch rocks. I got to have a couple of good ones, and that's fine. Then we'll, we'll try and figure it out. Obviously, you, the, we generally the back end. You know, for myself, they they give the if there if there's a really tough set of rocks, the two best rocks, the most consistent rocks, I will take because um, they just feel it makes more sense that I would have that, and then we'll move it down the line. Um, I, you know, Scotty, my son, he'll have the, he'll have the next sort of the best set. And then we, and then the, the, we'll, quite often we'll change it around. Like Dave and t- today, Dave and Tim, they'll mix them around a little bit. And, you know, Tim was saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hot, whatever. I, I'd like a little, I'd like a straight one. I don't mind a straight one today. So we'll, we'll move it around. So we don't always give it to our lead, but generally speaking, we move it to, to the lead position. Um, so when you guys are now practicing at this level, uh, being in the game for so long, um, what, is a happy performance in practice um like what what where do you go okay that's that's the last one i'm throwing today uh that was enough i feel now prepared and i'll, I'll be completely honest it, it depends on my body feels um at, at 57 years old i've thrown a million rocks in my day um still in decent shape my body's okay but my knee i have a i have a uh, i have a bit of a sore knee and if it and hip a little bit of that if it gets tired and sore i know that i've got to give it up i got to step back a little bit um i am one if it's feeling really good i tend to push it a little more and throw more rocks because i always still think that you know practice is is perfect uh practice makes perfect um but you also have to practice um you have to make sure you're doing the right thing you got to make sure that you uh um you have a purpose i think that's that's a key word that i like to tell the kids today have a purpose in your practice don't and I equate this to golf. If you, if you hit a bucket of balls, you just keep hitting balls for the sake of hitting balls. They're saying, oh, I'm practicing. But you're not trying to hit a shot. You're not aiming at anything. You're not trying to do something with the ball. Curling's identical. I'm just throwing rocks. Well, I threw 100 rocks today. Well, what would you do? I just threw 100 rocks. Well, no, that's, that's, that's not practice. That's just wasting your time. That, to me, I'd, re- I'd much rather see you throw 25 rocks, making a, you know, a, a, a little hit and roll with a certain speed, uh, a peel, whatever the case may be as opposed to throwing a hundred that, that don't have any purpose. So I, I'll always have a purpose when I go to practice. Well, I'll work on a draw, I'll work on my soft weight hit, I'll work on timing, I'll work on whatever. And if I get to the point where, again, my body starts getting tired, that's when I'll pack it in. Or if I'm not happy the way I'm throwing, I'll, I'll push it a little further. And what portion of that practice would you say is technical versus variable practice? Variable being just, uh, you know, uh, random shots and drills, and then technical being drill specific for uh, maybe recalibrating after a spiel um, or something of that nature. Not a lot of technical because I think uh, unless unless I'm unless I'm not sliding as well as I well say I'm drift, I got a bit of a drift going, or sure. if I my backswing, and of course I swing the rock, and I, I can get a little wonky with that. If that's all okay, I, I and I'm sliding fine. I don't even consider technical at all. I figure I'm in good position now. I go and make shots, and I just I all work on. Let's say I'm, I'm, my intern's been curling more than normal. Then there's a reason I intern. I'll get Scott to hold the broom. I say, I'll let that go. And I'll, I'll always get feedback. And it, you know, it, it, I, unfortunately, the majority of my career, when, when Russ left, I, I threw a lot of rocks by myself, which I don't, I don't recommend. That's to me, but that's the only way I could do it. I fit time in between work, tried to go into the club, have an hour, and I'm by myself. But that's all I had, so I had to deal with it. Now it's a little better. I was, I, my son, you know, Scotty curls with me. He lives right close to by. We'll practice together. A lot of feedback. How did I throw that? Well, Dad, you threw that a little tight. How did I throw that? You're still tight. Really? Okay, I'll throw that. That's better. Oh, okay. And it, it's, it's one of those where you, even after a bazillion years of curling, you still don't always throw it, you know, as well as you think you are. And you let it go. And I go, yeah, that's good. And Dad, he'll go, Dad, you're still tight. Really? And then you, you but it, I love it because that's, that's, the, that's the feedback. 
makes sense because what's why my intern's curling or whatever the case may be. So that's what you get and, and, and be honest. And I think when tell the, you know, it, it, well, yeah, you might have been a little inside. No, no, you're inside. You know, you got to, and you have to suck it up. And, and, and I think when you have two or three or four people out there, be honest with each other, you're trying to help each other out. It's all about getting better, not about just criticizing. And I think too, uh, with that as well, like having those communication strategies, like we talked about earlier, um, and understanding how to communicate to your players, uh, you know, in a game, just the same way, how do you get the most out of them in practice as well when you are there as a group? A hundred percent. And then again, like you said, like, so the same, so, and again, if, if Rylan, if Rylan's a sensitive guy and he's struggling, I've got to really figure out a way and, and he's not throwing his intern very well. And he thinks he's throwing his intern very well. We've got to come up with a way to show him without getting him upset. So there's all these different ways to do it. And, and that's where video can come in. You can actually slide at a broom and then you go, you go back and you go, Oh gosh, darn, I am sliding a little tight. And that, and anything that'll get you better, because that you want your teammate to get better. And I, I, I don't like. There are teams out there that they just individually go and try and figure it out their own. And um, you know, in our case, there is something like I could do to geographics. If you don't actually live uh, live close by, then um, you know, obviously, you can't all curl sure. together. But um, if if you do get together and and be critical but positive on the same thing. Okay, you threw that great, but you're a couple inches inside. So if you throw that same throw with a little bit more broom, you're going to throw that perk, blah, blah, you know, this sort of thing. Um, when you were teaching Scott and Carly, uh, what was the most important thing that you tried to make sure uh, that they learned and hope that they maybe hold on throughout their entire careers or, or the lifetime that they play the game? Uh, I really, I, I was still old school. I really taught them a delivery. I was really, really keen on getting a solid uh, um technical delivery, uh, same way my dad taught me, uh, and just to have fun. And, and I, I use that a lot, and you hear people talk about it, but I, I, I'm a big believer. I, want my, I wanted my kids to enjoy the game, so we kind of made it. We, when we had practices, we'd make fun. I had played little games, played little trick shots, whatever. It would got, you know, and they'd be excited to try a different shot as opposed to throw 45 interns, throw 37 hits in a row, whatever. We played little games and that sort of thing and made it fun, and they wanted to come back out. Oh, that's kind of cool come back out and we play what game we playing today dad and we do that and we go over that and we try different things and and, it, and little they know they're, they're they're all of a sudden they've thrown 50 rocks made a bunch of shots they're having fun we get a big laugh out of it and you know let's see if we can better our record whatever the whatever the, the competition is i made a lot a lot of little competitions i think that's healthy uh, um you know scott and i'll play a lot of even today we'll play a lot of one-on-ones we'll play skins games um, we'll sweep our own rocks. We'll do it. And it, it just makes it more fun. And you're, you're focusing and, and you're really concentrating on the shot. You're, you might be picking up, I'm looking at the bench leg behind the sheet. That's my broom, but I'm still, I'm thinking about it. I'm trying to make shots. It's not robotic. I'm actually using my brain to figure out how to make shots. And I try to instill that in the kids as well. Like it's, there's not a cookie cutter way to do this, figure it out on your own a little bit. And, and, and again, just enjoy it and, and really enjoy the sport. Um, yeah, I think just last question for you uh, for, for this, uh, this webinar. I mean, um, when you do hang up the broom um, some 2,000 years from now, um, <laughs> what do you hope that your, your legacy of curling will, will have become? Wow. You know what? I've, I've never had that question asked of me. That's interesting. Um, I think I'd like to be, I think I'd like to be known as, as a bit of a, a, a pioneer and innovator and um, um, probably just longevity in the game. Uh, the fact that I was able to stay competitive. Uh, I think I'm really proud of that. I, every, cause even I, I literally today, I can honestly tell you, you know, Brent and Rich play golf with them today and, and they both said, I don't know how you've done it. Cliffy, uh, <laughs> Cliffy being my nickname. I don't know how you've done it over the years. How's the body hanging? I said, you're really good. And he goes, you still have the, the desire. We see it. And I, 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 I like the fact that I, I want to win. I want to compete. I want to have fun. I love the game of curling. I love the fact that uh, I'm out there with the big boys. And uh, I guess the fact, I guess longevity might be the, and, and I've been, I've been stayed, I've stayed competitive in the game through my entire career. And I've been pretty proud of that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Glenn. Um, I'm, I'm just going to, stop the recording here. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for answering those questions. My pleasure, Ryland.